Yeah, our next speaker is uh, going to be uh, Danai Kutra from the University of Michigan, who uh, is um, quite well known uh, in the area of uh, summarization uh, of networks, uh, computing summarizations of networks. And um, yeah, um, without further ado, uh, Danai, please take over. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. And can you see the slides? Yes, as well. All right. all right. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together this event and for inviting me to present. Uh, I would also like to thank all of you for joining this meeting and also my live audience over here, um, my dog, who will voluntarily be an attentive listener today. So now you know what my setup is, even if my video is not on. So I'll be talking about the power of summarization uh, in network representation learning. And before I get to that, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with respect to what summarization is. And what I'll do is I'll define it in terms of its goal, uh, which is to find a short representation of the input graph, which reveals some patterns or some specific structure or maintain some uh, structural or other properties of the original graph. And now exactly what it will preserve depends on the application domain and the requirements of the application. Now the representation can be in different forms. It could be an aggregated graph where nodes are aggregated together into super nodes. This is one visualization here at the bottom where the original graph is represented by a smaller network with these big super nodes connected by super edges, or it could be a sparsified version of the original graph, or even just a set of structures, let's say interesting subgraphs in a graph. Now, why do we care about summarization? Well, by definition, it helps us reduce the amount of data and it reduces the storage requirements, which means that we have fewer input-output operations when we're applying algorithms on this data. Um, as a result, summarization can speed up algorithms and can make it possible to apply existing algorithms, even if they're not very efficient, uh, by applying them on this smaller data representation. Uh, it can also support interactive analysis based on a similar way of thinking. It has been used for understanding influence analysis uh, let's say between communities. And I also like to think about summarization as a way to eliminate noise. Um, and by doing so, it also reveals patterns. Um, lastly, it can also help with privacy preservation. Instead of making, let's say, um, available a large data set with a lot of information about uh, the participating entities, we can make available a smaller representation that has aggregate information about the entities um, so it can preserve privacy. So with my students, we've written a survey on graph summarization where we cover different methods. We categorize them in terms of the inputs, the input graphs on which they apply um, and uh, also based on the techniques. And we discuss open problems. So over the years, uh, we've worked on a lot of different aspects of summarization. We've introduced domain-specific summaries, interactive summaries, latent summaries that I will discuss later today, um, as well as different types of summarization knowledge graphs to enable on-device computing or just error detection and completion of knowledge bases. And a lot of my work also falls under these structural summaries where we want to find interesting patterns in the data. In this talk, I will focus on summarization in rep network representation learning. Uh, so I'll cover two different directions. One has to do with leveraging summarization within graph convolutional networks. And we'll see that this can help us with faster training, with denoising the data, and also it can help us gain interpretability. And the second uh, direction is um, what we call latent network summarization, which can be used for compression and on-the-fly computation of node embeddings. So I'll start with um, the first direction, and I want to set up the problem that I'll be uh, referring to, which is neural network-based classification. So imagine here that we are given a set of networks, 
uh, each network has an associated label. And what we want to do is come up with an efficient, interpretable, and parsimonious model that can accurately predict this label. And it can also explain why it's making this prediction. Now, this is motivated by an application that Michael referred to at the beginning of his talk as well, um, which is uh, in neuroscience. So we have several subjects. Uh, for each subject, we have their um, fMRI-based brain graphs. And we want to classify these brain graphs. And what we want to predict is a phenotype, for instance, cognitive or intellectual ability of these subjects. Now, of course, in graph classification, there is a lot of related work. Right? There are linear models that can be used. Uh, and actually, in neuroscience, they use uh, a lot of uh, ICA. These are great models for denoising the data, but they don't capture nonlinear interactions that have been found in real data sets. On the other hand, we have neural network models that do capture these nonlinearities, but they require many training samples. Often a lot, they learn a lot of parameters. They take long for training, and uh, they're often also accused as black boxes. Right. So the approach that I'm going to present briefly is called grouping-based um, neural network. Uh, which is fast, parsimonious, and interpretable compared to other models that were proposed at the time when this work was published. So let me give you a brief overview of the architecture, and then I'll go into a little bit more details. Uh, so as I said, this work is motivated by neuroscience, so I'll be referring to uh, brain graphs. And um, one standard way of generating brain graphs is to compute correlations between activations or activity uh, in different regions of the brain. So nodes correspond to regions of interest, edges correspond to correlation in activations in these regions. Um, since we're talking about correlation, there, is negative, uh, there are negative and positive edges, uh, which I denote here with orange and black edges, uh, respectively. Now, what we found useful in this architecture is to actually separate those two uh, representations and have two branches within uh, the neural network. Uh, so I'll be referring to the positive branch just because the negative one mirrors the positive one. So the first layer that we have is a node grouping layer. Um, or if you want the summarization layer. And essentially here, the idea is that we are leveraging graph summarization as a way to handle noisy data, uh, to train from small samples of high dimensional data, and also to support interpretability. And I'll get back to these points and show you how this is done uh, with summarization within this pipeline. Then the second layer is a random walk-based graph convolutional layer which captures the structure within this network that we've learned, this aggregated network. And at the end, we flatten uh, these embeddings, we feed, it into, um, we feed them into a fully connected layer uh, to uh, predict the label as it's usually done. So in terms of the summarization layer, uh, it is inspired by some recent findings that say that some nodes in the grass regions of interest in the case of brain graphs are more related to the phenotype of interest. So they should help us explain or drive the prediction. Um, so here the idea is that we're saying some edges are expected to be more indicative of um, the prediction label, of the label that we want to predict. So what this node grouping layer does here at the top is it aggregates nodes into these super nodes with these colored ovals that they have. Um, and it hides the non-indicative edges within a super node. These edges that are hidden, I have annotated with gray color. And then at the same time, it highlights the indicative edges, which span across different um, super nodes. Right? And a little bit more detail, essentially what we're doing is we're learning a matrix F, a common membership matrix F, which says which node belongs to which super node over here. And the values in this common membership matrix capture the important score of the node for the prediction task. So how much is it contributing uh, to the prediction? 
Now for interpretability, we apply several um, um, constraints. We want uh, this matrix to be non-negative so, so that we can interpret its values. That to be, and also we want it to be orthogonal. And one thing that I want to point out is that while in summarization, often we aggregate nodes that are well connected. Um, here, this is not a requirement. We learn how to aggregate nodes so that we can highlight the important edges. Um, so over here, you can see some super nodes that have few connections between the nodes. Right, and, and here I'm showing you what the adjacency matrix of the supergraph is in terms of this learnable common membership matrix and the original um, ma weighted um, matrix of uh, the original graph. Now, the, in terms of the random walk-based graph convolutional layer, uh, what we are doing is we're using random walks because it is a useful tool for uh, sampling graph structure. And you can think of random walk scores as quantifying similarities between um, all the nodes in the graph and the original seed nodes that I have marked here with stars on the left. Right, so the output of each layer I that we have is this random walk based um, representation and then we apply a nonlinearity uh, like Kregu um, to, to find the final embeddings, to compute the final embeddings. Now, one um, idea here, and I'm skipping a lot of details, but one idea here is to use uh, different queries uh, to learn structure at different distances. And this is one way of probing more um, the graph structure uh, rather than sticking with, let's say, three seed nodes um, yeah, at all and learning the, the embeddings um, or the context at multiple distances. So let me show you some results for this. Um, for some comparison with uh, neural network-based uh, methods uh, like DIFPO, uh, CNN with one or two layers, and then uh, GCN. And um, over here, I'm showing you the results for uh, graph classification tasks where we use fMRI-based graphs that are coming from different tasks like a motion, uh, a task that involves emotion, another one that has to do with sound, uh, gambling or a social task or working memory. So in all these cases, we want to predict uh, co the cognitive or intellectual ability of the subjects. And I'm showing you the training time versus the accuracy uh, of the model. Um, so the takeaway here is that grouping is up to 69 times faster than these baselines and it can achieve same or higher accuracy in different prediction tasks. The exact accuracy depends on the task. Not all tasks are equally um, meaningful or equally predictive of what we want to predict this cognitive or intellectual ability. Um, but the point is that we can train it faster because of this summarization layer that we introduced. Um, and you can see here why this is happening. Uh, so I'm showing you how many parameters group in needs to learn versus how many parameters the other models need to learn. Uh, so group in can use 15% or fewer model parameters and it still achieves similar or better performance. Right? And this is again, thanks to this summarization layer. Now, the last point that I want to make is in terms of uh, interpretability. And you don't need to worry about all the names here. Um, all these different acronyms that they have correspond to different subnetworks, brain subnetworks that are defined by experts like uh, uh, ventral attention cortex or vision cortex and so on. And in um, this uh, table, I'm showing you for the different uh, tasks that we have or the different data sets, if you want, um, which are the top three brain subnetworks that each method identifies as most important for making the predictions. Um, the ones that I have here in um, black font are the ones that are expected to be involved uh, in these tasks and they are related to cognitive ability which we're trying to predict. The, the gray ones are not corresponding to anything that is meaningful to neuroscientists. So the takeaway here is that grouping 
helps us identify these task positive subnetworks. And these subnetworks are known to be active during cognitively demanding tasks. Very right? well, PCA and DIFPOL, two of the baselines, uh, and PCA is a strong baseline uh, from non neural network methods. Uh, these are misled by strong noisy signals from mouth and hand motion. So during these fMRI sessions, the subjects are moving and they are talking, they're answering to questions, right? So the, the, these uh, other baselines capture a lot of these movements and less um, activity from uh, the subnetworks uh, that are related to the task and the, the attribute that we are trying to predict. Right. And this is again, thanks to the summarization layer, because of what we are doing in order to identify these regions in the case of um, grouping our method is we're looking at the edges that go across different um, um, super nodes that we have identified in these super graph representations, summarized representations. So um, I'll move on now to the second part of the talk, which has to do with latent summarization for compression. And so th there is no question that embeddings are powerful, right? They are used in a lot of different downstream tasks. Um, and, but one uh, disadvantage that they have is that they do take a lot of space. And right? if you think about a graph with 1 billion nodes and about you know, the traditional dimensionality of 128, um, we need about a terabyte to store the embeddings for such a graph. And we move away from the nice sparsity properties that the, the original adjacency matrix has, right? We're going into these dense representations n by 128, where n is the number of nodes. So one question that we um, wanted to look into here is, well, can we summarize these, right? So we defined the problem of latent network summarization and we're uh, given a graph, we want to find this compressed representation that captures, as I mentioned before, key structural properties of the graph. But here we require that this representation is independent of the graph size of the number of nodes and the number of edges in the graph. And because we want to be able to support downstream tasks, we want to also be able to derive node representations on the fly, right? So if I can summarize, the difference between this formulation from uh, the, the works on representation learning uh, node embedding. The, the main difference is that we are trying to learn a size independent representation while all the different works, and of course this list is not inclusive here or the comprehensive, um, all the, the other uh, works on node embedding learn one representation per node. Right? So if we have a lot of nodes, then there's a lot of representations that are being learned. So at a high level, um, we um, introduce uh, this uh, pipeline. So we are given a heterogeneous graph with weights uh, or without weights, with or without dimension uh, directionality in the edges. And the first step that we follow is we apply relational functions in order to aggregate structural features in the graph um, in an automatic way. So you can think of this, you can think of relational functions as the cookbook or the recipe to obtain um, context. And uh, some examples of relational uh, operators or functions is summation, uh, averaging, standard deviation, and others. Um, then the second step is to um, define this heterogeneous context in terms of histograms. Uh, and uh, you can uh, think of it as essentially a GCN uh, captures the context by averaging information. The neighborhoods here were saying, let's maintain histograms instead of just averaging. And that should be less lossy. Right? And in order to obtain the summaries at the end, we're looking for these subspace vectors for which we can derive the embeddings. So the latent network summaries that we have consist of the recipe, these relational functions that we have defined, and the low rank latent graph summaries that we can obtain, let's say with SVD or some other approach. And so I'm going to show you uh, some quick results on this. Um, first of all, I mentioned that summarization can help with reducing uh, space. So here I'm showing you 
um, how much space our method needs for the latent summary. And, and the method is called multi-lens, and here the space is in terms of megabytes. And we take into account different graphs with up to 4.7 million edges. And then we have different uh, baselines, line, node to vec, deep walk, metapath to vec, ASPM, and graph to Gauss. Uh, so here you can see how much more space other methods need for the embeddings. Uh, whatever I'm not reporting um, the, the numbers, we couldn't get the methods to run on these data sets. So in summary, multi-lens requires four to 2100 times less output storage space than other embedding methods. And importantly, the embeddings that we can learn on the fly from the summary are uh, still, um, um, can still perform really well in downstream tasks that we care about, like link protection. Right, so we can see that our approach outperforms a variety of different uh, baselines. Now, another thing that I want to mention quickly is an alternative way in which we can summarize or compress embeddings. Uh, so what we did in this case is we said we want to find binary hash codes uh, to represent the nodes. Um, so we are going back to finding one representation per node, but instead of having these real value dense representations, we want to find binary um, embeddings. And uh, here we consider a time evolving heterogeneous network and we want the binary hash codes to preserve similarities interactions, to be space efficient, and also to capture the temporal information and heterogeneity. I'm not going to go into details, I'll just give you some key ideas here. Um, so for heterogeneity, we are capturing the features and the node types. Um, for temporal dynamics, we rely on temporally valid random walks, so they respect time. Um, and we capture short or long-term interactions. And also we capture functional similarity between nodes um, or what is called the structural similarity between nodes um, through different features. And then um, we use locality sensitive hashing in order to learn these uh, binary uh, hash codes. And because of the binary hash codes, we can also satisfy the low storage requirement. Uh, in this case, we looked into the task of identity stitching. The, uh, this, is, this was the motivation for this problem, uh, where we want to match different online references of the same user in uh, real world web services. Um, you can think of it as a link prediction task, where if we predict the link between two nodes, we're saying that these two nodes belong to the same person, or these two instances belong to the same user. Right, so you can see here again, uh, the comparison of node to bits, what we call the method, um, against different uh, baselines that take into account um, dynamics or uh, static graphs. And uh, we perform better in this case. We also see that short-term tactic in the walks performs better. So it's better to sample edges that are temporally uh, close. And in terms of storage, um, output storage efficiency, we can see again here that um, our approach reduces significantly the, the space requirement that is needed. Um, and so it has, it needs 63 to 340 times less space than the baselines. And even if we were to use local assistive hashing after the fact to make the other methods uh, binary, uh, give binary embeddings, um, we see that they lose um, a lot in accuracy when that is done. So even if we make them use a similar space, um, they are less accurate. So before I conclude, I want to very briefly mention that most of the work in representation learning is based on proximity. Um, that is, it finds similar nodes in the same part of the network. Right? This is useful for several tasks like link prediction, clustering, classification, when homophily is assumed. But on the other hand, there is structural similarity that I touched upon very low uh, during the last work, which aims to find similar roles all over the network, like bridge nodes or peripheral nodes. And this is used for other tasks like role-based classification transfer learning. And I, I would like, I'd argue that sometimes structural similarity is more appropriate than proximity. 
This is indeed the case in single network tasks like identity resolution or user stitching that I mentioned in the last work, but also in multiple networks where we want to do transfer learning or in tasks like alignment and graph uh, classification that I've uh, worked on with some of my students. So if you're interested in the differences between proximity and structural role based embeddings, um, uh, we have outlined those in a recent article at uh, TKDD. So takeaways, uh, summarization within a GCN can help with faster training, with denoising the data and with interpretability. Latent summarization can achieve compression and on the fly computation of representations. And we found again and again in different projects that histograms are powerful at capturing the graph structure. And the last two works that I briefly mentioned are based on histograms. And we found that these are flexible and versatile. We can incorporate a lot of different properties of the graphs and they also incur less information loss. Um, and the last point that I want to make is that structural embeddings are less studied overall, uh, but they may be more appropriate for several tasks. So they're um, worth looking into more. So the talk is based on several papers. I'll make the slides available afterwards and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Danai, for an interesting talk. Um, I have a look at the chat. If people have been typing there, there you go. I think you can just read them out directly if you want to. I mean, or like with. So Santiago asks, for the multi-lens, how do you interpret the fact that this more aggressive summarization actually outperforms other embeddings in the downstream tasks? Right, so that's a good question. So we looked into different downstream tasks like link prediction and anomaly detection. In this case, we are generating, from the summary, we generate on the fly, the embeddings of the nodes for which we want to make predictions. Right? So if it is link prediction, let's say the, we generate on the fly the, the embeddings of the two endpoint nodes, and um, we use a traditional way of um, evaluating link prediction there. So we have to go from the summary to the embeddings in that case. But the point is that we don't need to generate all the embeddings. Right? We can choose only the ones for which we uh, the ones that we want to uh, use in the downstream task. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Answer the question. Let's see if we have more. There you go. Austin wants to know if you have looked at different embedding dimensions for different nodes as a summarization technique. So one node having I don't know dimension five and the other twenty three and so on. Um, so the reason being that a peripheral node might not carry much information, so it might need less dimensionality. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, we haven't done that. It would be interesting uh, to look into uh, different dimensions here, especially because it's possible to generate the embeddings on the fly, uh, this uh, like learning different uh, dimensionalities should be straightforward. Um, yeah, and I agree with you, like low degree nodes might not need the same number of bits are as high degree nodes, for instance. So, Austin seems to be happy with that answer as well. Any more questions from the audience? Otherwise, I guess we can say thanks to the summarization and thanks to Dai again for a nice talk.